Today I am going to explain how to beat the Seven of Hearts game in Alice in Borderland. Many have offered their suggestions as to how to solve this trial of death and anguish, but none do I believe have actually figured it out. And there's no trick here, this isn't clickbait. I will offer you what I strongly think is the answer. Of course, spoiler alert in this video, don't watch if you don't want things ruined for you. Now for those of you who need a reminder, Alice in Borderland tells the story of a group of disaffected friends led by avid gamer Arisu living in Tokyo who find themselves thrust into a parallel realm in which they are forced to compete in a series of sadistic death games in order to survive. Along the way, they meet a host of other characters in this world who help and hinder their journey through it. Now before I get into the games, I need you to remember this. As I bring up in all of the videos I've done on this show, Alice in Borderland is, thematically speaking, strongly focused on despair. As in, the hopeless, endless suffering that people experience in life. Much of which is further catalyzed by a misunderstanding about the purpose of their lives. Just as someone might say, misunderstand the purpose of a game. Now we see a total of six games play out during the course of Alice's first season. And as we learn from a participant, there are four types of games, all based on the suits in a deck of playing cards. Diamond games are battles of wits, spade games are games involving physical prowess, club games are team battles, and of course, heart games are games of betrayal and involve playing with participants' hearts. Now realize that I didn't say something like, club games require teamwork. I just said they're team battles. We have to be very careful not to extrapolate beyond what we're told in the show, lest we will misunderstand the rules. And as far as I can tell, in each type of game, there are many different skills, tactics, and other elements that can potentially be either useful or detrimental to a respective game's outcome. Each playing card also has a number, of course, which corresponds to its difficulty level, with, as it seems, higher numbers meaning greater difficulty. Now in Alice, we are privy to two hearts games. The first being the hide and seek game in the botanical garden, and the second being the witch hunt at the beach, the utopian oasis where inhabitants of parallel Tokyo can seek refuge and trade for their allegiance to the other members of the beach and commitment to help collect all of the playing cards. It's the hearts games that have been the focus of most of the debate surrounding the show, as these two that we saw were less straightforward than the other types of games and resulted in outcomes that didn't seem ideal. Well, then again, I suppose that's a matter of taste. The Seven of Hearts game has proven specifically impenetrable for aspirant solvers, as the conclusion of that game resulted in the deaths of three of the four players. The game took place in a botanical garden. The four participants, which included the three amigos Arisu, Chota, and Kurube, as well as their new acquaintance Sayori, entered into a hall abutting the garden, which provided them with the equipment they would need for the game, this one being called Hide and Seek. Over loudspeaker, a voice instructed the group to each put on a pair of goggles, which included a collar that affixed around their necks and locked in place. The voice then laid out the rules of the game. They were as follows. Number one, one person will be the wolf, and the other three will be the lambs. Two, the one found by the wolf will become the next wolf, a transfer process which is initiated via locking eye contact while wearing the goggles. Three, hide well so that the wolf does not discover you. Four, whoever is the wolf at the end of the game wins, and five, the game will last for 15 minutes, after which the collars around all of the lambs will explode. And good night. In other words, this is kind of like a game of reverse tag, where you want to remain it. The wolf lives and the lambs die. Which of course did indeed play out, as Arisu the wolf lived and the other three participants were killed by their headsets. Thus, we arrive at the point we're at today, with all of you kind souls debating how they could have attained a better outcome. I've scoured the internet for suggestions, and there's a range of them, but none of which I think are satisfactory. The most common suggestion is that they should have used the principles of reflection to outsmart the rules. We see Arisu, when he's the wolf, suffering quite reflectively a face a glass window as he ponders the abominable situation he and his friends have found themselves in. Well, some clever viewers have averred that had he calmed down for a second, he may have realized that he and the other participants could simultaneously look into the window and somehow use reflection to lock all eyes at once and thus all become wolves. Similarly, some other people have suggested that they could have used the video chat and or video recording functions on their phones to all make eye contact with the wolf at the same time. Now, my first issue with these types of suggestions is that we don't actually know if the transfer process will work unless eye meets eye, though it's possible the headset's technology can be manipulated via reflection. But still, I don't think these strategies would work because the first stated rule of the game is that one person will be the wolf and the other three will be the lambs. Good. 
So while I would love to see these theories tested, I imagine that somehow they would all fail, as there can only be one wolf at a time. The other type of solution I've seen proposed has to do with removing the headsets, which the characters do try to do unsuccessfully at times. Now first off, I definitely think they had to put on the headsets in the first place. After all, the game didn't start until the collars were locked in. I imagine that anyone without a collar at that point would have not successfully registered for the game, or perhaps even would have been killed right there. Breaking or subverting rules does not seem to be a good recipe for triumph in Parallel Tokyo. Remember, the participants are actually being watched by live people. They don't need to outsmart a computer, they have to outsmart humans who will know what they're trying to do when attempting to subvert rules. That said, proposals of this type most often suggest that they could have broken the headsets off. After all, the voice never said, don't take off the headsets. It only said the collars on the lambs will explode at the end of the game. And there was an entire table full of tools at their disposal that could help them cut the collars off. Some people even suggested that the tools could have been used to disconnect the collars from the goggles. Thus, the wolf could still wear the goggles and be the wolf, and the lambs could remove their collars set to explode. After all, the voice never said explicitly that removing the collar was against the rules. But then again, no voice specifically warned that walking out of a game would result in a participant's death either. No, it's something the participants in Parallel Tokyo find out the hard way. It's illogical to try and remove the collar based on precedent. The characters should know by now that trying to subvert the games is unlikely to end well. But American Ben, then why is there a table of tools there? I've seen lots of people on message boards asking this, minus my name, of course. There must be some reason. Well, I don't know. Why did the voice introducing the Witch Hunt game say this? The voice wasn't being dishonest here. I suppose the witch didn't need to be a woman, but it was a woman. The hints, rules, and tools provided with each game are not necessarily there to help the participants find a victimless solution. They are, however, sometimes there to make them believe there is one. And then sometimes they're seemingly there to add to the potential for chaos. The tools in hide and seek do both. They give false hope amidst a desperate situation that there is an answer that is good for everyone. But of course, what would we in the real world know about that, right? Now we get to the biggest mistake that people make with games of hearts. All of the suggestions I've listed so far involve working together. Teamwork, if you will. People seem to automatically think, man, they just need to work together in order to arrive at the best outcome. But that's more of a clubs game thing. <laughs> No, games of hearts are about manipulating people's emotions. They don't necessarily involve working together. Hearts games get people to turn on each other because sometimes that might be the best way for an individual to survive. Is it never true in the real world that society forces you to hurt those around you in order to survive? Or even just rise, succeed, or whatever? On the contrary, I would posit that very often one's success comes at the expense of someone else, and thus despair is made from earthly dynamics like this. When I first went back to try and deduce the solution to this game, I found that one line in the rule stood out to me above the rest as peculiar. If it's good to be the wolf, then why would the voice tell them to hide from the wolf? Sayori even notices this contradiction. Now, some people have noticed this paradoxical sequence of stipulations offered by the voice, and such people have thus been led to assume that the answer was for everyone to hide from the wolf, and this way everyone would have lived. Of course, this is clearly wrong, because the collars on the lambs will explode. However, it's half right as well. The lambs were supposed to hide from the wolf, who ultimately, because of the high level of anguish in the game, may very well come looking for the other players in order to transfer his wolf status to them and sacrifice himself. However, hiding would not result in the lambs living, no. It would still result in their deaths, just as the simple rules describe. There were two possible outcomes of this game. Three lambs die and the wolf lives, or all four players die. Yes, the answer, and the dark truth, is that Arisu and his friends beat the game.
Arisu almost lost it by removing his collar and weakness when he was the wolf, an action that would have resulted in his death and after another few minutes, the deaths of the other three as well. The group can win. They can win by keeping one person alive. Who says that winning necessarily means that everyone lives? Does war work that way? The implication of the voice telling the lambs to hide is that the winner should be selected by the participants. Perhaps they should choose the person most worthy of going on. Karube is the one who first has this epiphany. I believe that he actually solved the game because he's tough-minded. He decided that Arisu was the best choice to be the person who survives and goes on, and he thus calmly acquiesced to his fate. Sayori, of course, would not be able to accept a selfless fate, but fortunately, Chota had a similar realization to Karube, and he's surprised with his inner, okay, and outer strength, holding Sayori down and not letting her go after the wolf. Remember, it seemed like Sayori was slowly grooming Chota to be her pawn, but in the end, Chota held strong, because Arisu most deserved to go on. It's funny, I wonder if Sayori hadn't had sex with Chota, a move I'm sure was intended to be used to control him later, if he would have felt too unfulfilled to make his latter sacrifice in the garden. But alas for her, Sayori allowed him to check that off his bucket list, and in doing so, perhaps doomed herself. Yes, I know the end of the game seemingly produced a horrible outcome, and it did, but there is a spiritual triumph that was had. Though admittedly, that's a rather meaningless consolation bearing in mind the probable finality of death. Amidst all of their mental anguish, the group avoided the worst option and came to terms with death while allowing the strongest player to live. Remember, Arisu is Alice. The software in the goggles remind us of this. They read Arisu's name as Alice. And Alice must survive Wonderland. And this game was intended to get Alice, aka Arisu, to either pull off the headset and die, or go and find the lambs and work together in a way that would be more likely to lead to all four of their deaths than if the lambs were to stay hidden from him. Your rules may stipulate that winning means getting a happy ending, but you don't make these rules. The Game Master does. You know, in reading all of the proposed game solutions across the internet, one assumption that almost all solvers make is that there is a victimless solution to every game. There must be. For some reason, humans are conditioned to believe that all decisions involve one answer that results in negative outcomes and another that results in positive ones. And hey, this is an optimistic belief, one that is reinforced by many movies and TV shows throughout history. However, the truth is that sometimes there are only better and worse answers, and sometimes there's a very fine line between them. Sometimes all roads lead to some amount of pain. That is the truth of life. And at times it's futile to try and cheat pain, get around suffering. Sometimes you have to accept it and realize that at times you are going to feel bad. You can't feel happy all the time. You can't win all the time. Such a state would imply a lack of improvement anyway. However, in every moment, you can learn. You can experience, you can feel, you can make progress, despite how you're feeling. We might say that Alice in Borderland puts the viewer in the same position as the game participants. You're frustrated and stumped as you fruitlessly try to solve the game in a way that it cannot be solved. You have to think like the Game Master, who clearly has no issue killing players. In the tag game, players were going to die no matter what. There was no victimless solution. The purpose of the games in Parallel Tokyo, whatever it may be, is not for everyone to live. That is not a prerequisite for winning. And you may say, wow, what a harrowing situation. Yes, this is what is being conveyed to you. The struggle that reality presents us with and the despair that we feel in attempting to confront a world around us which is filled with inevitable suffering one way or another. But my friends, don't feel overcome. Oh no. See, not everything about the games is yet known, and the characters you think you know, you may not. You should perhaps even ask yourself why I am here right now sharing these things with you. Am I doing this of my own volition, or is this just another part of the game, designed to prepare you for its next stage? Subscribe, my friends, and comment down below. You're not going to want to miss what's coming next.